Dyra from the American Bible Society, Dr. Blumenthal. It's been a while, probably forget how to even preach. <laughs> God has been a good God, and we thank God for his faithfulness and for his grace. I just have the fourth installment for you. I can only give you one installment per week. And some of you probably forget what we started out several weeks ago talking about. Uh, what we want to talk about you are never alone in the battle. That's what we started out talking about. You are never alone in the battle. I don't even remember when that started out. Uh, sometime in August. Uh, August 31st. Yes, I'm seeing the date at the top there. August 31st. Uh, the last time we, we started out, you are never alone. I thank God for his faithfulness and thank God for all that he has done for us. And I thank God for uh, uh, Sister Cameron who has been there for these 33 years. One of the things that, that keep amazing me over the years, and especially in these past few years, is the people who don't even know me don't even know me, know nothing about me, making up stories about me, and they don't even know me, don't even know me. I thank God that I came to the Lord Jesus Christ when I was a boy, and I have never left the church. Backsliding never entered into my mind, never entered into my mind. I've been there, I've seen a number of things, I've heard a number of things but God has been faithful I remember 40 years ago myself and brother Don Jew we were out in the forest at the campsite 40 years ago he was getting ready to go to the agriculture school we were there working on the campsite preparing it for camp in August and then he and I had to fetch a, <laughs> to carry a very large piece of lumber and I was laughing at him. He was rolling his shoulder and he's saying to me, you can find out. I'm trying to let the thing sit on, the, on, the, on the, 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 the back of my shoulder. And I'm, you know, having it resting at the top. And we're going through and making fun of each other. And uh, while we were there, a, a message came up to him saying that you need to return to the city because you have to register the agriculture school. And he went on to the agriculture school, graduated from the agriculture school, started to work with the Ministry of Agriculture. Then God opened the door and he went to Scotland, to, went on to the University of Ghana, did his bachelor's degree, then went on to Scotland and did his first master's degree in Scotland. And we have been in contact all the time. He and I have attended conferences together. Then he came back and served and then migrated to the United States, went on to become a professor in Pennsylvania. Went back to Scotland to do a second master's. I keep saying, well, you don't do the PhD. Went on, did a second master's in Scotland. And uh, we thank God that over the years, we have maintained, he and I and his wife and their children, maintained that relationship and that friendship. And sometimes I wonder, people who don't know me talking about me, he has known me for 40 years, more than 40 years. 40 years, we were just working together as young men on the camp, but he's known me before that, uh, as well as his wife. And I thank God that he is a good God. Amen. Listen, they said about Jesus that he was a wine bibber, a friend of harlots and publicans and that kind of story. If they say those things about Jesus, I am not Jesus. I expect them to say other things about me. Didn't they say I took a million dollars from a church that never had a million dollars? <laughs> Are you thinking yet? They said I took a million dollars from the church that never had a million dollars. After they heard that we bought a building and we paid $1.5 million, uh, the enemy will try to strip you of your dignity. Understand, that's one of the things. Hatred and envy and malice and bitterness know no boundary. They will go to any limit to strip you of your dignity. But when you know Jesus, you don't have to worry about what they say, what they do. You keep doing what God wants you to do. They will continue to. You think that they were happy that we bought that property? You think, you think? I was telling a friend that for me it has been a sacrifice to, to, to be at Lighthouse with everything around you increasing. And I have never taken a penny increase from Lighthouse from the time this church has started. 
Are you hearing me this morning? We had everything that is increased. I said to them, when you call me to go to the hospital to visit, I go there on my own gasoline, not on the church's gasoline, on my own gas. And the reason I, did, I, I do that, because it is my desire to make sure that the Lighthouse has a place uh, that it can worship God freely, that we don't have uh, to have the problems of picking up and putting down and building up and breaking down. And thank God that God has honored that commitment. This past week, we've ordered the chairs. I want you to know we've ordered the chairs. And we've ordered 400 chairs. That you won't have to sit on these chairs anymore. That when you, during the winter months, you don't have to worry about these cold chairs. You are sitting on the best that they have. The best church chairs that they have that we've ordered for you. Amen. I'll let them talk. My mother used to say, you can't stop the birds from flying. You can stop them from building a nest in your life. But God is a good God. And I am continuing to trust him and believe him because he is a faithful God. So we want to look at the fourth installment coming out of Isaiah chapter 43. You remember the, the text, Isaiah chapter 43? I'm going to finish in time. Don't, don't worry. I'm not the everlasting preacher with the everlasting gospel. <laughs> We'll get through. Amen. Isaiah chapter 43. Let's, let, let's remain seated. I'll read uh, just a few verses. I think we're dealing with verse number 3 and 4 today. Verse 3 and 4. Let's, I'll read 1, go on to 4. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. And those words are very important and instructive in the text. Fear not. For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Verse number two. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I give Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia, and Saba for thee. And verse number four. Since thou was precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. And this installment is, you are precious to the Lord. You are precious to the Lord. Let's roll for point number one, then come down to point number four. Let's go back to point number one and come back to point number four. What was point number one? Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. God said, fear not. Fear is something that has the capacity to traumatize us and terrify us. But God says, fear not. If God says, fear not, I don't need to fear. Because fear has torment with it. And God says, fear not. Number two. I have, I have called, called you, you by name. name. People might not call your name. They might not remember you. Everybody here who was born in this country and who came to this country, you've got a number that they call social, secu social security number. Whenever you go to open a bank account, they ask you for your number. Oh, some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. They ask you for your number. Everybody got a number. I got a number too. Ask me for my number. What's your number? And sometimes they ask you, what are the last four digits of that number? You've got to give them the last four digits of the number. And they ask you, well, like, well like, you know. <laughs> and so you give them the last four digits. I have called you by name. God has, seen, God has called you by name. In the multitude of people, God has your name. When, when Jesus came by, he looked up and says, Zacchaeus, come down. He knew his name. God knows your name. Number, number three. God will stand with us during our times of adversity. That God will stand with us during our times of adversity. God knows that the preachers today tell you that you will not go through any adversity once you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is not in the scripture. It is far from what the Bible teaches. The Bible says any man who would live godly in this life will suffer persecution. So persecution is part of the package. And so when you hear preachers telling you on TV that once you give your life to Jesus, you will never have struggles, you will never have persecution, that is not true. The Bible does not tell us that. Are you hearing me this morning? 
And so we've got to get back to the days of reading the Word of God and understand what the Word of God says. The reason the enemy hates me because I am telling you what the Word says. I don't care about sharing with you my opinion. My opinion is not important. What is important is God's Word. Are you hearing me this morning? What is important is God's Word. My opinion is my opinion. I don't preach my opinion. My opinion is my opinion. But when I stand before you, I want you to hear what the word of the Lord says. Because that is what will bring change in your life. That is what will bring, that will cause your situation to go into reverse. The word of God. God says, I send my word and my word will, not, will accomplish what I want it to accomplish. It will not return unto the Lord void because it is God's word. So God will stand with us during our times of adversity. And today, we want to look at you are precious to the Lord. Maybe nobody has ever said to you that you are precious. Tell the person next to you, you are precious. If you're sitting next to your wife or your husband, say it with some kind of meaning. You are precious. You are precious. You are precious. You hear all kinds of stuff people say to you, all kinds of negative things they say to you, that you're, you're fat, you're ugly, you're this, you're black, you're tall, you're, 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 you need some food, and all kinds of negative stuff you hear. But every now and again, it's good to hear that you are precious. Oh, y'all not here this morning. You are precious. You are precious. Let the devil know that you're declaring that, that you're precious. And if you want to personalize it, you can say it of yourself, uh, to yourself. I am precious. I am precious. I am precious. Because once God says, I am precious, it doesn't matter what anybody else say. It doesn't matter what they say. They could say all they want to say. I am precious. I remember my friend, Brother Don, you was traveling one day going to Linden. For those of you from Guyana, he was going to Linden. And uh, he got up to give this woman his seat in the bus. And the woman said, I, I, did I tell you I want a seat? <laughs> Listen to me. When you're precious, you don't care what other folks say. You are precious to the Lord. Sometimes you don't feel that way, but God says you are precious. And the reason the Lord would not leave you in your distress, my brothers and sisters, is because you are precious to the Lord. It cost Jesus his life on the cross of Calvary. He gave up his life so that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, if Jesus did that for us, it means that we are precious to him. Because you are not going to die for somebody that is not valuable to you. You're going to die for somebody that you consider to be valuable. And Jesus sees you as valuable. To God, you have value. To people, you might not have value. But to God, you have value. To your husband, you might not have any value. To your wife, you might not have any, any value if you're in an abusive relationship. But thank God that there's some of us who are not in an abusive relationship that we can look at our spouse and say, you are precious. We can look at, at him or at her her and say that you are precious and I need to really really clarify when I say spouse when I say spouse here I'm talking about a husband who is a man I'm talking about a woman who is a wife who is a woman I am not talking about the other people that you talking about I'm not they're not part of my message here today I am straight on the Bible are you hearing me this morning I am straight on the Bible my concept of marriage is what the Word of God says are you hearing me? My concept of marriage is what the Word of God says. You ask me what my concept is, I will tell you my concept is what God's Word says. Because this is where my arguments stop, at the Word of God. I am not following any philosophy of any man, I'm following what the Word of God says. Preachers get into trouble when they try to become cute and want to become politically correct. The Word of God is never politically correct. Oh, you are hearing me this morning. The word of God. Jesus came up to the woman and the woman came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I need you to do something for my child. And Jesus said, it is not meat for me to give the children's bread to their dog. The, Jesus, you calling me a dog? But Jesus looked at this woman and said, it is not meat for me to give the children's bread to their dogs. The woman said, but master, the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. 
she was willing to go through whatever it whatever it took her to make sure that the favor and the blessings of God came upon her life. Listen to me. You think it in this modern society it would have been politically correct for Jesus to tell the woman that it is not appropriate to give the children's bread to their dog. They would have had him before the court. They would have sued him and done all manner of things. The Bible is not politically correct. It is heavenly correct. The church has suffered from politicians in it. Oh, you are going to get that some other time. The church has suffered from politicians in it. I thank God that we don't have a, that structure where you come voting people in and that kind of story. Voting them in so that you come in with your political self and trying to, to maneuver and do all kinds of stuff and mess up what God wants to do. Are you hearing me this morning? You vote and vote what God wants done out. You vote what God has called out. You're amazing. Amazing. Are you still here this morning? <laughs> Look at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 13. You're precious to God. Precious to God. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 13. Wherefore remember that, he that be ye being in time past Gentiles, Gentiles in the flesh who are called what? Uncircumcision, uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, the circumcision in the flesh the made by hands. hands. Remember that in the past you were not a people. Remember in the past you were regarded as Gentiles. And this is the re what Jesus was referring to when he talked about the dogs. Because Gentiles were regarded as dogs uh, by the Jews. They were regarded as people who were of no value. And so Jesus was not actually calling the woman a dog. He was saying from a Jewish cultural perspective, when we look at the other nationalities around us, we see them like we see our dogs. But here was this woman who was willing to say, Jesus, whether you see me as a dog or whether you see me as this, I have a purpose for being in your presence today. And I am going to have my needs met because I am in your presence. When you are in the presence of the Lord, whatever your needs are, God has the capacity and the ability to meet those needs. If you will connect with God and connect with his word, for he is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. If God has spoken, God will bring to pass his word. Hallelujah. That at that time you were without Christ. We were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. When you come in and you're not, you're not a resident of this country, you're going into a line they call alien. You are in an alien line. You are a foreigner. You don't belong you are alien from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. That you could not call upon God and the, and the promises that God made available to Abraham because you were outside of that covenant. But I thank God for Jesus, my brothers and sisters, that all of the promises that God made to Abraham, those promises are for us as a result of us being in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I shared that scripture with you that because of Jesus, the promises that were made to Abraham, we can access those promises uh, that God made to Abraham. What are some of the promises that God made to Abraham? God promised Abraham that his descendants would inherit uh, the promised land. Uh, God promised that they are, that they are going to be blessed going in, blessed coming out. Uh, God promised them that the sickness and the disease he placed upon the Egyptians, he would not place upon them. Hasn't God blessed you with your own home? Hasn't he blessed you with, with your own car? Hasn't he blessed you with good health? Hasn't he blessed you with life? So those blessings, those covenant blessings that are in that covenant, God has given those to us. And all we need to do is to access them, access those blessings. Hallelujah. Forgiveness of sins. All of these things are part of what God said that he would do for us. Go back to the scripture and we'll get back to what you have there. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes, ye who sometimes were far off, are what? Are made nigh by the what? 
by the blood of Christ, we who were outside of God's providence, outside of God's plan, outside of God's provision, outside of the covenant, as a result of Jesus, we now are brought near to the Lord Jesus because of what he did for us. It is not nice to feel, it is not a nice feeling being an outsider. But now we are no longer an outsider. We are inside with Jesus. We are here and joined here with the Lord Jesus Christ. We used to sit in the kitchen, but now we are at the table. We are at the table. We are at the table with the Lord Jesus Christ. They used to come out and feed us in the porch, but now we are no longer in the porch. We are not out there anymore because of what Jesus did for us. Are you hearing me, saints of God? You are not ordinary as a child of God. Stop looking down on yourself. You are precious to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are precious to the Lord. Yes, you might be going through some struggles. Yes, the enemy might be beating up on you. Yes, some folk might hate you. And don't worry, people will always hate you. I've said to you, if you are looking for everybody to like you, you are tripping. Everybody will not like you. Are you hearing me this morning? Everybody would not like you. Don't matter what you do. The folk, you, 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 you feed them, you clothe them, you do so much of them, and they turn around and bite you. And the good old Jamaican song say, you feed, you, you, you feed maga dog, and maga dog turn around and bite you. Are you hearing me this morning? So if you are looking for everybody to like you, you're making a mistake. What you got to do is make sure that your relationship with God is right. Your relationship with God is right. That is your assignment to make sure that your relationship with God is right. If your relationship with God is right, don't worry about the other folk saying stuff about you. They talk about Jesus, they will talk about you. Hallelujah. Go back to, to, to verse number 13. And so we were not a people. We were not a people. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. The apostle Peter describes for us the, the uniqueness of this precious relationship the saints have with Jesus. The uniqueness of this relationship. That we have with Jesus. Let's go to First Peter chapter 2, 9, to 9 and 10. But ye are what? But ye are what? A chosen generation. God has chosen you. Of all the people around, God has chosen you. He has chosen me. Do you feel chosen today? He has chosen you. A royal priesthood. A holy nation, a peculiar people. And the word peculiar in the old English does not mean what they think it means today. It means that you are precious to the Lord. That you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of where? Darkness into his what? Into his marvelous light. There was a time when I walked in darkness. I lived in darkness. My speech was darkness. And everything about me was darkness. But today, God has brought me into his marvelous light. I am not the same old person that I used to be. I am a new person because of Jesus Christ. Not because of the church. Not because of my own self. But because of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Verse number 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. I was reading and studying something about Mahatma Gandhi. And I told somebody, they said, Man, what are you reading about Mahatma Gandhi? Well, as a preacher, you got to read wide. You got to be reading real wide because you're giving information to people and you got to be sure about what you're saying to them. When Mahatma Gandhi went to South Africa, he was living in South Africa for a number of years, he connected with a number of pastors and preachers and bishops, and they were trying to impress on him to become a Christian. And he read the Bible. He read the Old Testament and he read the New Testament at least about four times. And then when he went back to India, that time he was fighting against the British to get independence for India. And so he was fighting. And the Christians 
in, in the missionaries in India at the time uh, stood on the side of Britain regardless of some of the atrocities that Britain did uh, to India at that time and that made a, a, a real strange impression on Mahatma Gandhi and he said something he said if the Christians had lived like the Jesus I read in the Bible India all of India would have served the Lord Jesus Christ and when I read that I said then he went to church in Calcutta, went to a Christian church one Sunday. He decided, I'm going to visit a Christian church in Calcutta in India. And he went to the church in Calcutta in India. And the usher at the door said to him, this church is only for white folk and high caste Indian people, people like you. This is not your church. And he walked away from that church and rejected Christianity. Are you hearing me this morning, saints? Are you hearing me this morning? Are you hearing me this morning? That we, when you consider, we, in times past, we were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Sometimes I wonder if by our attitude, we don't turn a lot of people away from the Lord Jesus Christ. I was telling my wife the other day that those young people who lost their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in 2008 in March, was it March or April, whenever it was, I kind of forget in this story. Whenever it was, 2008, when that incident occurred, and those young people who have lost their faith in God and have not even considered walking with God, let me tell you what the scripture says about those people who caused that to happen. The blood of those people, God would require it on their shoulder those who have given up on God God will require the blood of those young people on their shoulder let me tell you something is what the Word of God says when you cause one of these little ones who believe in me and little is not chronological we're not talking about numbers here people who just come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you cause them to lose their faith in Jesus Christ Jesus says it is better for a millstone to be tied around your neck and you to be cast into the ocean let me tell you something it cost Jesus his blood it cost him his life and every soul is precious to the Lord regardless of who you are whether you whether you're white black or Chinese God every soul is precious to the Lord I thank God that I have a relationship with Jesus because if I did not have a relationship with Jesus I would have walked away from God a long time ago let me tell you something when you come up against legislation that says in order for you to become a regional superintendent you had to be a missionary meaning you had to be white to hold those positions and when God decided to move and the tide change and I became the first black regional superintendent they changed the rule and they abandoned the region because I am not supposed to hold a position like that but I know Jesus but I know Jesus I know Jesus, people discriminate against you, they say things against you, they do things against you, but I thank God that Jesus has not done anything against us. He has done so much for us, whereof we are glad today that we can celebrate the greatness of our God that he sits upon the throne. We were not a people, but now we are a people. We are the people of God. I offended some people when I said in a very important meeting of the highest echelons of a particular denomination and I said that wisdom and knowledge don't only reside in the United States. I offended them when I said that. Wisdom and knowledge don't only reside in the United States. There are places around the world where you will find people with wisdom and knowledge. When Brother Paris was teaching in the school, a young man said to, the person said to Brother Paris, you have an accent. And Brother Paris said to him, English is not an accent, it's a language. Oh, y'all gonna get that next week. Brother Dan Chu was teaching at the college that he's, he's a professor in Pennsylvania and a young man approached him and said, hey, sir, you got an accent and trying to make all kinds of difficult situations. Brother Dan Chu is a professor. 
And he said, everybody prepare for quick, uh, 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 prepare for quiz, prepare for quiz. I'll tell you something, he who made the trouble, uh, he failed the quiz, and I'll tell you what happened, the rest of the students nearly killed him. Do not mess with the professor again. We did not prepare ourselves for this quiz. You who were not a people, God has made you a people. Don't let folk look down on you and think that you don't have any value. Then you think about the people in Ferguson who had all those troubles and still going through. And people think that they're hooligans and, they're, and, they're, and they're, all they're, they're, they're good for nothing. Let me tell you something. God has made us a people who were not a people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The worst thing we can do is look down upon ourselves. God sees us as chosen. It means that God has meticulously selected us for a divine purpose, irrespective of the circumstances of our birth. God said in the past we were not a people, oh, but thank God for Jesus that he died that we might have life and have it more abundantly. His death has made us who were not a people into the people of God. We did not obtain mercy, but now in Jesus we have obtained mercy. My dear brothers and sisters, you are not a mistake. You are a miracle. You are not a mistake. You are a miracle. You are a miracle. Your father might not have been married to your mother and your circumstances of your birth might have been convoluted, but you are a miracle. God has you here today and you are precious to the Lord. You are precious to the Lord. Precious to the Lord. You are not a mistake, you're a miracle. You are a miracle, not a mistake. You are a miracle of God's divine choosing. And sometimes we view ourselves as ordinary and insignificant while God sees us, sees us differently. We must ask the Lord to help us move beyond ordinariness. If we can confess that we are faithfully and wonderfully made in the image and likeness of God, it will help us to shut the door on negative thoughts. Look at Psalm 139 and verse number 14. I'm near done. Psalm 139 and verse number 14. I will praise thee. Yes, I got problems, but I will praise thee. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul know it right well. I am marvelously and wonderfully made in the image and likeness of, my, of Almighty God. Hallelujah. That for me settles all the insecurity problem. Let me say it again. That for me settles the insecurity problem. I cannot be insecure because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I cannot be insecure. The devil is a liar. No matter what you do, your stuff is not going to cause me to be insecure because I am wonderfully and fearfully, or I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul know it full well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have to speak. We have to live like we're precious. Speak like we're precious. Confess like we are precious. And be honorable in our daily conduct. There are four things quickly I want us to conclude with that characterize the saints who are precious to the Lord. What's the first one? Give me some volume here. What's are, the first one? They are led by the Holy Spirit. They are what? They are led by the Holy Spirit. People who are precious to God are not led by their flesh. They're led by the Spirit of God. And the people who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God, are the people of God, the sons and the daughters of God. Look at Romans 8. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds, cut off the deeds, separate the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are what? Led by the Spirit of God. They are what? The sons of God. They are the sons of God. Verse number 14. Oh, that's verse number 14. Let's go to number 2. What's the second, the second thing that characterizes the saints who are precious to the Lord? Number 2. They do not trust their flesh in matters of the Spirit. They do not trust their flesh in matters of the Spirit. Here is where... 
people who are in science, if they're not careful, get into trouble. Because sometimes uh, we allow our training to dictate the, what God wants to do. We've got to get to the place where we understand that while God respects our training, God is looking for our faith in his ability to work. Are you hearing me this morning? We've got to understand that this is not about science. It is about faith. Because the Bible says, the just shall live the just shall live by faith. And we have respect for science. We are not going to ridicule science. I have been the beneficiary of all, the, all of the, the development in science. And I told you when I had that, that, that stone in my bladder the size of a lime. And they put me to sleep as part of science. And they went in there with a laser and shattered that stone. And clean all of that stuff out and send me home the next day. We have respect for that. But over and beyond that, we must understand that in the spiritual context, uh, the just shall live by faith. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit, uh, meaning that as a result of what Jesus did, our hearts uh, became circumcised uh, as a result of coming into relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have what? Uh, and have what? Uh, no confidence in the flesh. When you put confidence in the flesh, the flesh is going to fail you. You've got to put confidence in God. While I appreciate the fact that you love me, you care about me. And I celebrate that about you. But over and beyond me, I want you to put your confidence in Jesus. I want you to put your confidence in Jesus. That doesn't give me a license to live anyhow before you. I still have to live the way God wants me to live before you in keeping with his word. Because you look to me for an example of godliness. And I understand that assignment and that responsibility on my life. But over and beyond me, Jesus is your perfect example. He will not fail you. He will not fail you. Hallelujah. Number three. They are mature when under pressure. The people who are precious to God, this characterizes their life. They act mature when under pressure. Every one of us here in this building, you live long enough. At some point in time, you are going to come under some pressure. It might not be today. It might be next week or maybe next year or sometime down the road. But you've got to act mature when you're under pressure. Look at Second Peter chapter 2, 3 and verse number 18. But what? But what? Grow in grace. That you've got to grow up in your relationship with God. You can't be the same place every year, every week. And the, the same thing that bothered you last year, still bothering you this year. You've got to mature and grow up in your relationship with God. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. If I would preach the same like I did last year, it doesn't show any growth in my own walk and development with God. As far as I know, and as far as I can see, that I am doing better than I did last year in terms of how I put together God's word so that you can understand God's word. So for me, every year, I have to improve on my own development in God. Are you hearing me? Because if I come before you with stale bread... Oh, y'all didn't hear me. Some of you probably eating steel bread. You didn't even know you're eating steel bread. <laughs> but I got to come to you with fresh bread. Fresh bread so that you can feed on fresh bread from God so that your life can be what God wants you to be. I am not with you every day. I don't know the challenges that you face in your home, at the workplace, on the road. And therefore, when you come here, I need to make sure that I feed you fresh bread. That when you go out there and those demonic spirits get in set to attack you, they can't attack you in here because this is holy ground right now. They can't attack you in here. But when you step out of this building, they'll come against you. But you need to have the word in your spirit that you can fight the enemy and say, devil, you are defeated in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. What's the last one? 
are fully committed to Jesus and his word. So they're mature under pressure. You don't cuss in them behaving bad under pressure. They turn to see who is there with you. Somebody cut across you on the road and you start using... <laughs> We don't have anybody like that here today. Some, you know, somebody just shoot across you when they should not shoot across you. And you, you got to pinch yourself lest you say the wrong things. <laughs> Repent. <laughs> Number four, they are fully committed to Jesus and his word. They are fully committed to Jesus and his word. Go back to that scripture in Joshua. That's a special scripture to me. 33 years ago, when I got up to respond to the speeches which were made by all of the people who came to our wedding, I didn't remember a lot that the people said. But one thing I remember, they said some wonderful things. They said some wonderful things on that day because the people who were there were friends and family and close associates. And they said some wonderful things, words of encouragement. But I don't remember all that they said. But I remember when I responded and said, Master of Ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I remember saying, like Joshua, I want to declare today, I had no, we had no children. We didn't even know if we were going to get children. We didn't own our own home. And so I said, as for me, and my house, we will serve the Lord. For 33 years, that scripture has been true for us. Been true for us. We have led our children to the Lord. And I've said to, to, I've said to you time and again, that what right I have preaching to you and my children out there running drugs, doing all kind of stuff. I got to fix my own house before I can fix your house. I would lose credibility if my children are out there in the world doing crazy stuff. And I am telling you that God wants you to do this. Folk, do it. But my first assignment is to make sure that my house is right. My house is right. Because if my house is right, I will make a bigger impact on you. Because when I stand before you, I stand before you as a living example of what God's grace can do and accomplish in the life of one who is committed to God and don't stand before you as a phony are you hearing me today my brothers and sisters when i came to this country and one sunday morning i'm driving to church and god said to me why is it so many of the young people the children of some of the believers at that church they're not even interested in walking with God and I'm driving and I'm coming down I'm trying to, to think I'm trying to find an answer to give to the Lord before I get to the first service and I got no answer many things are going through my mind and I got no answer and as soon as I drive into the parking lot the Lord said I got an answer for you the Lord said they see one image in the home and they see another image at church and they're confused they don't know which one to believe whether the one they see in the home or the one they see at the church and because they're confused over what they see at home then when they come to church then suddenly they see this wonderful hallelujah righteous glorious image but in at home is a living hell and so the children reject both they reject the one at home and they reject the one at the church and they say we ain't want anything to do with this stuff and I said, brethren, here is something I want to say to you that God said to me. And I told the church what God said. Listen, my brothers and sisters, if we are going to be the people of God, it got to be the same image in the home. And it got to be the same image at church. It got to be the same image on the road. We've got to be consistent in our walk with God. They are fully committed to Jesus and his word. I gave you a definition, my own definition, not Webster's definition of faithfulness. Please get it for me. Then let me tell you something. I write in my own dictionary. Some of you think only Webster could write dictionary. I write my own dictionary, my own dictionary. Please put up my meaning of the word faithful. My mean, my, the meaning of the word faithful. You mean they can't find it yet? Our commitment to God, a person or a company. Yeah, you got it. But I want everybody to see it. I want everybody to see it. 
What is faithfulness? When the men's department asked me to speak at the prayer breakfast on faithfulness, uh, I said to them that this is a definition that I got from the Holy Spirit, that God gave this to me, not Webster, not any of the other people, did any di other dictionary. Faithfulness is a conscious and deliberate dedication or commitment to a person or a cause. And in this case, uh, to Jesus uh, and the cause of the kingdom and the cause of Lighthouse. You are precious to the Lord. You are precious to the Lord. You are precious to the Lord. I have one more installment in this sermon series to give to you. But next week we have the doctor here. The following week we will conclude the sermon series. You can get the tape if you need it. God is a faithful God that you are precious to the Lord. Do you feel precious today? Do you feel precious? Do you feel precious? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, for my brothers and sisters who might not feel that they're precious to you, that the burdens of life and the challenges that they face on a daily basis seem to press them down and back them into a corner where they don't feel precious. But God, over and beyond their feeling, they're precious to you. And we pray this day, Father, that you will cause them not to look down on themselves, but to look up, look up to you. Because God, you sent Jesus into this world to die for us. And we thank you that each one here today, regardless of the circumstances of his or her birth, are precious to you. And we thank you today for all that you're doing. I ask that you will bless your people when they feel alone, when they feel fearful, and they feel that nobody is there. You are there. May they find the strength to call upon you, knowing that you will hear and that you will answer. And as your people go through this week, Father, I pray that you will go before them, go with them, take care of every situation that they would deal with, Father. Give them wisdom to deal with every challenge that the enemy will bring along their pathway. And that your people will go out blessed. They'll come in blessed. They'll go to bed blessed. They'll rise blessed because of our great God who sits upon the throne. We give you praise and give you thanks for all that you've done today. We honor and we bless you. And as we leave this place, Father, we ask that you will go with us to our homes and take us there safely. And to you we will give all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And praise God. Please shake hands with somebody and tell them you're precious. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Please remember you have bread at the back. And uh, please make sure that you collect those bread that they have at the back. Leave a donation for the people who give us the bread. Amen. We are not taking any of that with us home. You need to take all that you can.